church. Why don't we stand? We'll open up in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence in this room, Lord. We thank you for this holy, this holy day. God, I ask for your blessing over this service, Lord, your blessing over the message, your blessing over this time of worship, God, your blessing as we partake of the body, the blood. God, we ask that you would just move amongst your people, Lord. Father, we pray that you would be exalted, that you'd be magnified. And for those that are here in this room and those that are listening uh, from their homes or, or wherever they find themselves right now or, or throughout this week, God, I pray that you would just move within the lives of your people, that you would draw them closer to yourself, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty, and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice and shines like the sun in all of its brilliance? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You would take my place. You would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for you. All that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. You would take my place. You would bear my cross. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You lay down your life. And I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I 
sing for all that you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus. Filled with the glory of God. 
Jesus. And the whole earth is filled with the glory.
King of Kings 
filled with wonder. Filled with wonder. Oh, struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Good evening. Good evening, church. Uh, just some announcements. Our Easter service will be this Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Uh, we'll have a choir and a kid's spot. Um, our Easter offering envelope will go towards the care and maintenance of our outside grounds. Um, elder nominations, nomination forms available are in the fo are available in the foyer, and we can return them by April 11th in the offering basket or to Marissa. Um, Good Friday service is going to be tomorrow, April 2nd, from 7 to 9 p.m., and that'll go into our all night prayer. Reaching for the fringe Easter drive, um, we need. Candy is needed uh, Saturday, April 3rd from 10 to 12, so you can bring it here um, or to Elder Deb when you see her. Um, our Selah Ladies Prayer and Worship Night, um, that'll be for April 9th at 6.30. Um, and then there's going to be a family game dinner and cornhole tournament. Uh, Saturday the 17th at 1 p.m. And can we have um, our ushers come up for the tithe and offering? And I'm just going to pray for the offering. Father God, thank you so much for bringing us here tonight together, uh, whether we're here or at home watching tonight. We just pray that you bless this offering to do your work. And for those who may be struggling, Lord, that we pray also that you can make a way for them and bless them, God. And we just pray as this Easter weekend comes up, this Resurrection Sunday that's coming, that you will help people to come back to you or to come to you for the first time, um, whether they come out to church or watch it online, just let them be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Make sure you get involved. Get plugged in. There's a lot going on. Come out, support your
church, support your pastors. Hope to see you guys tomorrow night. God's good, right? He's moving through this church. He's moving within this church and within the lives of the people here. So let's participate in, in what God's doing. Let's do one more song together. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart. You know, as we, as we look at this week, you know, it's amazing how we see Jesus coming in and his triumphant entry into the city. And as he's coming in, they're singing and they're dancing and they're praising. What a difference a week makes, huh? Because by the end of the week, we see a change. By the end of the week, we see it go from praise to uh, accusations. From Son of God to crucify Him. What amazing God we serve. Can you imagine being the father and your child 
is going through this. So I don't know, I don't know about, about you, but I could not, I would not stand by and let my child go through what Jesus went through. But we have a, a father, a father up in heaven that, that actually allowed it. Hallelujah. He allowed it for you and me. He allowed it so that you and I could be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Because any other way, it would have been impossible. So he sent his only son. That he would be beaten, tortured, and then hung on a cross, nailed to a cross for our sake. See, whenever, I, whenever I think about that, it just brings me to a place where I just, <laughs> I'm not worthy, precious God. But you knew that, and you did it anyway. Father, tonight we come before you, and we, we stand here, Lord, just saying we're not worthy. We're not worthy of the love you've displayed upon us, Lord. But you did it anyway for our sake. So Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we, we walk through this week with you. Lord, we celebrate you. And we cry, Lord, when when we think about the things that you had to go through. So, Lord, tonight, Lord, as we talk about your last supper, Lord, as we, as we talk about the event that happened, Lord, and, Lord, all that was circled around your perfect timing, Lord, we, we celebrate you. And, Lord, as we take communion tonight, Lord, Lord, we take communion, Lord, with hearts that are reflective, with hearts, Lord, with hearts of repentance, Lord, with hearts that are sorrow and hearts that are joyful. So we thank you and we honor you. We glorify your holy name. We love you so much, Lord. Have your way. Father, hide me. Spirit of God, speak through me. Have your way here. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, somebody give the Lord some praise. He's worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't God good? All the time. You got that right. <laughs> hey, before you sit down, can we just get right into the word and uh, then I'll let you have a seat. Uh, we're going into Matthew chapter 26, looking at just two verses tonight. Just two verses. Actually, three verses. Looking at uh, 26, 27, and 28 of Matthew 26. 20, Matthew 26, we're looking at 26, 27, and 28. Hallelujah. First book of the New Testament, if you were wondering. <laughs> Somebody say amen when you're there. Amen. I was reading out of the NIV version. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Father, have your way. Speak in us. Show us. Reveal to us. Lord, use us. Uh, Lord, do your 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 work in us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, what did Jesus say to the head waiter at the Last Supper? Anybody know? What did Jesus say to the head waiter at the Last Supper? Separate checks, please. Marissa told me that. No one's going to laugh at that. Ah, Marissa, you're watching. They laughed. So 
we come into this scripture at a point where they're now celebrating, well, actually, yeah, they're celebrating the Passover, but they're having what we know as the Last Supper. And, and prior to this, Jesus has sent his disciples into the city in order to prepare for the Passover meal. And, and they're at this Passover meal, and Jesus comes to a place where Jesus takes this bread, he breaks it, and he gives it to them, saying, this is my body. And he pours the wine, and he gives it to them, and he says, this is my blood of the covenant. These emblems, these are emblems of power. And that's the title of my sermon tonight, the emblems of power. Have you ever asked yourself what these emblems represent, what they mean? Why do we take them? How, do, how does it apply to what happened on the cross, and how does it apply to Jesus? And we can look at the, the superficial, and we can say, yeah, you know, uh, you know, yeah, Jesus is breaking the bread. He says his body is his body, right? And the wine is his blood, and it's just what it is, right? But have you ever really thought about it? Have you ever really thought about this dinner and actually what's going on here? Actually, the depths of what's happening in this moment and how special this moment is? This is one of the most special moments in history because so many things are happening and so many things are coming into place at the same time, at the perfect time, at the right time for all of us to be saved, to have salvation, for, for mercy to be given. You know, I used to hear all the time uh, people say, you know, before you take communion, you should examine yourself, right? And if there be any sin in your life, then you shouldn't take it. And then, uh, I, it always kind of stuck with me a little bit when I heard that. And I was always kind of like a little weird about it. You know, because why would Jesus give us communion if we had sin and we couldn't take it? Because if that was the case, no one could take communion. It would be a, a, only for one person, Jesus. Right, so he, he, he did what he did so that we could take communion so that your sins could be forgiven. And I, I never understood that. And I was like, well, I, I do understand examining your heart and your mind so that you could be reflective. And you can actually understand and think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. This is important. Because we, we shouldn't come up and take communion just for the sake of communion. Without any understanding at all on why we're doing what we're doing. So tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about this, this special moment in time, this special time that God gave for us to look back on and see. Jesus came to die for us so that we could be free. The only prerequisite that you have in order to receive his salvation and the mercy that's given to you is for you to say, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I died for me on the cross. You're good. Imagine that. In this world today, think about it. In this world today, what would you have to do? How much would you have to pay to get freedom? If your life was in jeopardy and you had to face a life sentence, what would you have to give? What would you have to do? to be free. And here, here Jesus is saying, the only prerequisite for what I'm about to go through is that you believe, that you believe I am who I say I am, and that you believe I died for your sins. That, that blows my mind. Like if you ever see the picture of the, the mind ex, like exploded from the head, like this was like, right? that's me when I think about that. Because that's amazing. And I don't know that we often really think about communion, think about the Last Supper, and actually what was going on at that moment. When we partake of the communion emblems, the wine and the bread, it represents a one-time event, the crucifixion of Christ. One-time event. A one-time event that will never happen again, ever. A one-time, special, supernatural, out-of-this-world, amazing event that will never happen again. And we get to look at it. We get to see it. 
And what's amazing is we get to look back on it and see and see all the, of the effects that that dinner took and how it happened and how Christianity spread throughout the world and how there's millions of people now that know Jesus and how there's millions more that will get to know him. Hallelujah. Communion also represents a one-time event of when, of when we are saved. At communion, I always think of God, how he saved my soul and how he delivered me and made me free. See, when I take communion, the things that are going on in my mind is I'm thinking, man, God, Jesus, you, you set me free. You set me free, Lord. And I don't, I don't even know that we really understand that. See, because we, we, we live in America, the land of the free. Right? We can do what we want. We can say what we want. We can go where we want to go. Right? We got freedom. But it's not the type of freedom that you really, really can think about, that you really know. And this is the type of freedom that gives you an eternity. This is the type of freedom that says when, when, when you die, you don't die. This is the type of freedom that says you have eternal life. That you don't go to that place with the capital H. But you go to the place with the capital H. <laughs> the provisions that God has made for us through Christ is for the past, the present, and the future. It covers all time. There's no other event. There's no other event that's ever happened that covered the past, the present, and the future of all time. And here, here we get to be a part, and we get to see and actually take part in, in this special event of the communion. The true Paschal Lamb was Christ, and he was now ready for a sacrifice. Yet, yeah, yeah, check this out, check this out. He was, he was ready to be the sacrifice, and at the temple... They were actually doing sacrifices. So, so he was ready to be the sacrifice, and at the temple, they were doing useless sacrifices. Because at this point, Jesus is here, and, and everything of the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrificial system is now past tense. Because now there's a new system coming into place. So as he's about to be sacrificed, they were sacrificing. <laughs> Amazing. He is God's Passover lamb because he has passed from eternal, we have, he has passed us from eternal death to eternal life. And that's, that's amazing. That's incredible. You know, I, sometimes I, I, I just, I, 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 I don't understand it. I really don't. I, I truly, if I could just, can I be real for a second? Can I be a little real and transparent just for a second? All right, then I'll get back in pastor mode. All right. So, so I, I, I can't understand it. Everybody in the world, every single person in the world should be on a knee praising God, praising Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because if I look at myself, I'm rational. I'm a rational guy. I think rationally. Right? I'm not a loony. I'm not crazy. I'm not out of my mind. Well, maybe a little bit. But I can see I, I've experienced Jesus Christ in my life. I know that he lives. I know that, that he does work in people's lives. I've seen him change people's lives. And yet so many don't believe in him. So many don't follow. And it just, to me, that, that just, just confuses me because it's so clear to me. And this act on the cross was so powerful and so incredible that someone would give their life for their enemies. Someone might give their life for their friend. Raj, I'll lay my life down for you, bro. Right? But that's my brother. But would I be willing to lay my life down for someone I don't know? Worse, better yet, better yet, will I be willing to lay my life down for someone who put me on the cross? who banged the nails in my feet and in my hands? Would I be willing to die for them? Would any of us be willing to even do something nice? Never mind die. Would we be willing to do something nice for someone who came, who came against us, 
who we consider an enemy. Amazing. Angela of, uh, of Fal- Faligno said, if we but pause for a moment to consider attentively what takes place in the sacrament, I am sure that the thought of Christ's love for us would transform the coldness of our hearts into the fire and love of gratitude. If we just thought for a minute what happened at this moment, it would change our cold hearts into fire, into gratitude. See, because that's what I think about when I think of Jesus on the cross. That's what I think about when I take communion. I think about he died for me. He really did. You know what? He really did. First lady, he really did die for you. Donna, he, he died for you. It's not, it's not this blanket thing, right? It's not this, this overall thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, thought he died for everybody. He died for you. Al, he died for you. Debbie, he died for you. He thought about you on the cross. That's amazing. So as I look at this, this dinner... So I look at this Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper, what the Jews and the Israelites called the Passover. I see three things I want to talk to you about tonight. And we're going to talk about the emblems, the, the blood and the, the body and the blood. But I want to talk to you, too, about timing, the timing. Because I, I don't know that we truly understand the timing. Right? Everything God does is in perfect time. He doesn't do anything out of time. See, the problem, the problem that a lot of us have is that we understand God's will, but we don't get God's timing. So you can have God's will, and you can do something that's within God's will that God wants you to do and be out of time and it be a mess. We see this in scriptures, right, when David wanted to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And, and it was God's will for David to have the ark in Jerusalem. But he didn't do it in the right timing and in the right way. And because of it, someone died. And it wasn't until he figured out to consecrate the priest and to actually do it in the right way that they brought the ark in and and it was glorified and and everything was perfect. But when we do it, sometimes we get lost in the timing. And when we get lost in the timing, it gets messed up, even though it's God's will. And and, and that may sound weird because it's like, hey, if it's God's will, how can it be messed up? But it's got to be in his will and in his timing. And as we look at the Last Supper, this is perfect timing. This is, like, ridiculously perfect timing. So if we think about it, right, the Last Supper was, was, uh, was at the time of the Passover. So let me refresh you about the Passover. The Passover was when the last miracle that God did for the, for the nation of Israel before Egypt freed them. It was the, the, the angel of death that came into Egypt, and they had to put the Passover lamb, the blood of the lamb, on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over their homes. And only the firstborn of Pharaoh would die. The Passover. And you know what's interesting about the Passover is that they were given a specific time to kill the lamb so that they can then have it and eat it and put the blood on their doors. And that time was about 3 p.m. So they were told that they needed to kill the lamb at a specific time in order to have everything be ready and prepared for this special moment. And as we look at the cross, and as we look at everything that happened there, Scripture says, or or even the commentaries say that they believe that Jesus died at about 3 p.m. The timing, the timing is too perfect. God saw it all. He saw the perfect lamb of God sacrificed for the eternal sins of men and, 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 and taken the place of our sins the same way the Passover lamb took the place of their firstborn sons. Amazing. And this Last Supper is happening on Passover. The perfect time, the Passover meal. As I'm looking at this, I'm going, man, this is insane how God's timing worked out so perfectly. 
And if we, if we really want to look at it, I don't know if you guys, I don't know, firstly, if you remember when we went to Israel. So we went to Israel, and so the upper room, where they believe the upper room is, nope, the other picture, right here, right? So the upper room, that's where they believe that the upper room was, and we got a chance to go there, and, and it was actually pretty cool. We saw some, some uh, teenagers were praying, and they were, like, singing to God. They had their hands raised. It was, like, amazing. I said, I want them in my youth group, right? But what's amazing about this is that this upper room is literally above where they believe the tomb of David is. Show that picture now, the other picture back again, right? So Jesus, the lineage of David, is having his last supper to be on the throne forever, right? As God promised David, above where they believe David was buried. The timing, right? It's amazing. I mean, the things that God is doing, he's orchestrating, he's bringing the old in, he's bringing the old out, and he's bringing the new in. Now there's a new covenant that's taking place, and it's, it's, all, it's all in the right timing. Jesus is in the perfect timing. He's doing it all, and it's all happening right here at the Last Supper. And it just, it just, it just, uh, it just amazes me. In Exodus chapter 12, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of, first, of, of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it, keep, keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. All right, um, Exodus 12, 5 and 6. So it just goes to show that the Passover lamb was actually killed in the evening the same time that Jesus died on the cross. The timing. It's all timing. God's perfect timing. And as I look at this, I'm, I'm like, it's amazing because we, we see a few things come together. We see the, 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 lamb, the lamb that the, that the Israelites were celebrating, it was Passover time, so they're celebrating a lamb who, uh, who allowed their firstborn sons to live, but they don't realize that in the upper room, right above David's tomb, the Lamb of God, who's about to sacrifice himself for everyone to live for eternity, was on the scene. Amazing. The timing was incredible. Somebody say timing. Let's talk about the body for a second. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. As I was, I was thinking about this, it kind of, it brought me to another scripture in John chapter 6, where Jesus talks about, he says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat, eat the flesh of, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood eats, has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And scripture says that after he said this, a lot of people kind of left, right? But he got a little weird on him, didn't he? Jesus got a little weird on him. I mean, because imagine if I'm sitting here and I'm saying, hey, guys, you got to eat my flesh. You got to drink my blood. He'd be like, yeah, I think it's time to go. Like, <laughs> I got to get going. He got a little weird on him. But he wasn't literally saying that they would eat his flesh and drink his blood. He was talking about a time to come. He was talking about uh, uh, this communion. He was talking about uh, his word. See, Scripture says all the time 
that we should devour the word. We should chew on the word. We should eat the word. We hear that all the time, right? And, and who is the word? I believe in John it says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word, and everything was made through the word and for the word. And then the word became flesh, and we called him Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So when we chew on the word, we chew on his flesh. When we take communion and, and we, we break the bread and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Again, we see a similar, uh, uh, I, I can't think of the word I want to say. Again, we see a, 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 a similarity. <laughs> I don't know why I got stuck on that. We see a similarity to the Passover lamb, which was broken, right, and then served. And we see Jesus Christ, who was beaten and abused, but then served out for all mankind. The body. And so when we take of this, it's not like we're literally, literally eating his flesh. But we are eating of his flesh when we eat of the word like we're doing right now. Right? When we're digging into his word and we're talking about it and we're chewing on this stuff, man, and we're digesting it. We're eating of his flesh. And we're also eating when he breaks the bread and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. So he wasn't, he wasn't speaking literally and he wasn't being weird as people took him to be, he was being literal. And he was saying, you know what? There's going to come a time when you're going to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And if you don't do it, then you can have no part in me. Which, again, is why I kind of get lost when people say, well, uh, I'm not going to take communion because I'm not ready. I go, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not ready? No one's ready. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has sin in their life. We take communion, and the opportunity that we have when we take communion is to reflect and ask God to forgive and repent of that very sin that's now preventing you from taking communion. When we take the, blood, the, the, the bread, the body, we do eat of his flesh. There's, there, this is no supernatural event happening in reference to the bread, but, it's, but it is symbolic of the sacrifice that Jesus had made for us. In the same way the lamb was broken and laid out before, for the redemption of the firstborn of Israel, Jesus was beaten and laid out for the redemption of us all. So when we take of the body, we should be remembering the sacrifice of Jesus and how he gave his body for us. And, and I don't know that, that we do this because we so often take communion and we just kind of get our cup and we open it up, and it's, when they say, take the bread, we take it, and they say, drink, we drink. But I don't know how reflective we are. I don't know how much we really kind of get this and understand what's actually going on and what we're actually doing. The body of Christ is the price paid for salvation. It's the price. It was the price paid for your freedom. I think about I think about what I what would what would I do for someone who paid such a heavy price for me? What would I do? And he's saying you'll eat of my flesh and drink of my blood or you'll have no part in me. So when we take communion that's what we're doing. We're taking part in Jesus Christ, in the actual act of his crucifixion and of his sacrifice. And when we choose not to do that, when we don't do it, then we're not taking any part in the, the very person who gave his life for you, who paid everything, who sacrificed everything for us. See, to me, that, that just makes no sense. To me, that's a, that's a, a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. I'll take communion. Matter of fact, Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll go where you tell me to go, and I'll, I'll, I'll say whatever it is you tell me to say. I'll do it, Lord, no matter how foolish it might sound, how silly it might look. I'll do it. 
because of what you've done for me. Freedom. You know, someone, someone once said, uh, uh, freedom, how's it go? Freedom doesn't cost you anything. Freedom comes at no, freedom comes at no price, but it'll cost you everything. All right? So I think I messed it all up. <laughs> all right? I'm like the guy who can't tell a joke. All right? So, so I, so, but what I'm trying to say to you is that for you, freedom came, it seems like it comes at, at, at no cost. It's free. But it costs everything. You know, and, 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 it, and it will cost us everything in a sense because if we give our lives over to him, then we have to give up those worldly things. We have to give up those things that we desire, those things that we want that's worldly in order to pursue him. The body of Christ. He sacrificed it for us. He was broken for us. And when we take communion a little bit later, let's just think about that. Let's just think about how we need to just reflect on, on him. This is, not about, this is not about us. This is about him. This is about Jesus. This is about everything that he's done, everything he went through for us. That's what this is about. It says, because it says, it says, when you do this, remember me. Right? When you do this, remember me. So we've, we've, we're humans, so guess what we've done? We've taken the act that he said to do in remembrance of him, and we make it about remembering us. We, we take it, and I, I'm thinking about my sin now. When the reality is, is that he said, when you do this, remember me. Because your sin's already been forgiven. So you don't have to think about your sin. Focus and think about Jesus Christ. It's amazing. It's amazing. We haven't even gotten to the blood. We just talked about the timing in the body. It says, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hmm. So this blood of Jesus, it actually ushers out the old and brings in the new. And what I mean by that is before Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrificed on the cross for us, the Israelites had to go through an old sacrificial system where they would have to sacrifice certain animals for certain sins. And if you wanted to, to get forgiven of your personal sin, you had to sacrifice certain animals. If, and then they had to sacrifice certain animals for the nation's sins. And that was a, a continual, all-the-time thing because no one sacrifice could redeem your sins forever. And here now Jesus is coming in. He's saying, hey, we're going to get rid of that. Because now it's going to be one lamb, one bleeding for all time and for everyone. No more do you need the sacrificial system because I'm willing to sacrifice myself for everyone for all time. And this sacrifice had to be a blood sacrifice because sin came in the world through the blood and it had to be redeemed by the blood. So we see here that Jesus is redeeming the sins of mankind with one thrust, one act of the cross. He's wiping out the old, and he's bringing in the new. So the blood is actually doing two things at once. It's, it's, it's bringing in a new era, a new covenant, right? You're under now a new covenant, and that same blood that brought in the new covenant is now also cleansing your sin. Just like that. What a God we serve. Man, he, he can come in just like that. New covenant. Nah, that stuff's old. We got a new covenant. And guess what? All of everything you've ever done that was sinful, don't worry about it. I forgive you. Just like that. Through the blood of Christ. 
It's amazing. And I don't know that we actually sit down and actually think about this. And as I was studying and I was looking over this stuff and I'm, I'm going, man, this, is, this, this one supper, there's so much that's going on right here. There's so many things coming together at the same time for us. This is the climax to the story. God is, God is about to bring, so, so it's like at the point of the movie where, where you know that the major thing is about to happen. And if there was music being played, that would be when it's like, dun, 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 because you know the bad guy's going to look like he's going to have his way. But the reality is, is that the good guy comes in and saves the day. There's power in the blood. <laughs> Would you be free from the power of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you err evil or victory win? There's <laughs> there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. That's so true. There's power in the blood. Amazing, wonder-working power that cleansed all our sin, that changed the world. You know, this, this, this moment in time it's so special that for us, it actually changed the landscape of time. So we actually went from a portion of history to a new portion of history, from A.D. to B.C., right? There's an actual change in the, in the time frame that we mark at, at this moment, that Jesus is so powerful, such a son of God, that his body was broken for us, his blood was spilled for us, and it changed everything for all time. Everything for all time. Heavens. The heavens quieted for a minute. And everything just went quiet because of what happened on the cross. Because everybody, the angels, the demons, every single person on earth, everybody knew everything just changed. You ever had a moment where, where you just said, you know what? Something just changed. Where you're like, hold on a second. Something just changed. That's what this was. This was a change in the moment. A change for all time. And, and thank God. Thank God. Because if not, we would not have the freedom that we have. We would not have the ability to say, Father, we love you. Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. We wouldn't have the ability to have the Spirit of God dwelling within us and Jesus Christ within us. This is the most amazing time in history, and we get to look at it, and we get to partake in it, and we get to celebrate for it. And I, I, I know as we look at this week, and we look at what happens, Jesus gets arrested, and the high priest and all his bad guys come in, and they beat him up, and they torture him. They humiliate him. Right? They walk him, bearing a cross, put nails in his wrists and his feet, hang him up on the cross. But this is a moment, as sad as it is, of celebration. It's, it's a moment that changes the world. It's a moment where God says, no longer... And am I going to work in this way? Now we're going to work in a way where if you just believe in my son and you accept him for who he says he is, that he died for you, you have eternal life. There should be more than one person clapping for that, right? You have eternal life. Hey, let's not get, let's not get bored, Right? with the word of God and, and, and some of the things that we've heard a thousand times, 
right? Because when we do that, what we start to do is we start to, to take the word and we try to, and now we start to change a little bit so that we can make it different. And we can't make the word different. The word is the word, right? And we have to get excited about it. Even if you've heard it a million times, you still got to get excited about it because it still means the same thing. It still means that you are saved. It still means that you're free. It still means that you have a God that loves you, a God that watches over you and protects you. We have to be really careful that we don't get tired of hearing the words so that we're like, Ugh. yeah, I, I know, I know. He, he took the bread and he drank the wine. Heard it a thousand times. But do you know what happened? Do you know what was going on? Do you understand the, the situation here? We should celebrate that all the time. And we shouldn't look for ways to try to make it more interesting. That when we do that, we change it. And now it's not the word of God anymore. Now it's something else. That's why you guys should be happy that you're in this church because you have a senior pastor and you have pastors that preach the word of God. And they don't look to change it or, or make it better so that we can make the masses happy. I don't want to make the masses happy. I want to make God happy and I want to preach his word. I don't know where that came from. But anyway. <laughs> Amen. 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 We're talking about communion. I digress. <laughs> So we're going to take communion here in a minute. Justin, can we come up? <laughs> communion also represents an ongoing relationship that includes the blood for the forgiveness of your sins after you have been saved. And the communion represents the spiritual strength that you gain by feeding upon the flesh of Christ. See, when they ate the Passover, yeah, um, Kyle, you can come up. When they ate the Passover... They gain some strength by eating the Passover. When we eat the Passover, we gain spiritual strength in Jesus Christ. The bread and the cup are not really elements, are not really, are not holy elements in and of themselves. But they do represent something that is very holy. So it is with great respect and reverence that we come to the communion table, recognizing it is a symbol of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross. So we come with great reverence to the communion table, recognizing it is a symbol of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Great reverence. This is a holy moment. It's about what he did on the cross. It's about what he went through. It's about his sacrifice. It's a holy moment. And if we make this about anything other than Jesus, we actually diminish his sacrifice. We actually take away everything that he's done. So if I were to say to you, examine yourself, I would say examine yourself so that you can reflect on the true nature of who Jesus is and what he's done for you and in your life and what he's going to continue to do and will do for you in your life. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the God above all gods. There is no other. There is none. Hallelujah. So while they were sitting at the table, he took the bread. Precious God. He broke it. He said, eat. Eat this. This is my body, which is broken for you. Hallelujah. You may eat. Thank you, Jesus. Then 
Then after, he took the cup. And he said, this, this is my blood which is poured out for, for many. When you drink of this, think of me. Remember me. He tells them that he would, he would not partake of it until the time when they could drink of it again in heaven. Can you imagine the day when we meet Jesus? I think of so many things that can go on in that moment. But I think he's going to have two cups in his hand. He's going to give you one, and he's going to have one. He's going to toast and say, you made it. Welcome, my child, my love. Then he said, drink. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your perfect. Father, we thank you for your perfect timing. That you orchestrate every moment. And Lord, as you orchestrated every moment of the Last Supper, of the Passover, of the lineage of David, of Lord, how all of those things came together, Lord, I know that you also orchestrate every moment of our lives. Lord, that you have it planned out. And Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that as we are in this world where everything is fast-paced, everything is rushed, everything is do it right now, that we would have the patience to wait on your perfect timing. Lord, that we would do things, that we would follow your will in your perfect time. And Lord, I pray every time, Lord, we would take communion and we would take of the bread. Lord, every time we would read your word, Lord, John 6 would come into our minds. Lord, it wouldn't weird us out, Lord. It would, it would give us joy to know that we are partaking in you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, when we would take the, the cup of wine, Lord, and we would know that our sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Lord, that the Lamb of God paid the ultimate price for all time. Lord, I pray we would take this message, Lord, and we would not just have it here in this church, Lord, but we would take it out into the streets. Lord, we would not be afraid to share it with others, Lord. Lord, that others would also know about your goodness and your greatness. Lord, that they might get to know you like we know you. Lord, you know, I, and I pray, Lord, over this church, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, over our pastor. Lord, I pray you would continue to give him a heart to preach your word as it is written. Lord, that we wouldn't feel the, the urging or the necessity to preach something other than your gospel. We love you so much. Have your way here. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know what scripture says? That after they took communion, they sung hymns. They worshiped and they praised God. So can we worship a little bit before we leave tonight? Can we honor God a little bit before we leave tonight? Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken.